Oh, uh, my name is uh, Marco Berocal, and uh, as uh, Michelle mentioned in the uh, initially this morning, I'm the guy from Costa Rica. <laughs> I'm the one who came as far uh, from to be here. It's an honor. I'm really, really uh, excited about it. Um, I'm a WordPress developer. I worked uh, both Green Geeks, uh, which is a hosting company, and I work for the Boston Globe as a WordPress developer. So uh, I participate in the community in Costa Rica, meetups. I've been an organizer. I'm a huge uh, WordPress uh, fanatic, and I absolutely love, as, as you highlighted, the whole community aspect of it, of helping each other out, of contributing, of, of you know, um, making a life of what we give. So today, I am going to share a little bit about the experiences on becoming a, a WordPress uh, developer. I've been doing this for the past, I would say, 13, 14 years. And, you know, what does WordPress bring to the ecosystem? What does it bring to the world? So first, it's market share. It's a huge uh, market, 40%, um, 45%, I think it stands, of all the websites out there use WordPress. And that, that is a huge, huge, huge uh, number. Um, I'm going to have to use my glasses because I can't see the this <laughs> anymore. Uh, hold on. Yeah, I was going to look at the thing, but <sighs> getting old. There we go. Can't look at my phone anymore. So I would say it's it's market share. Uh, like I said, it's it's a forty percent. Uh, it's entry level. Uh, one of the things that um, back then when I was developing, when I started to do, uh, got serious about this, one of the things I had to decide was which content management system to use. Back then it was in pretty much an option between Drupal or, or WordPress. And one of the things that swung um, or I heavily leaned towards WordPress was the fact that, first of all, clients absolutely loved using the interface. They were like, oh, this is so simple. You know, it's like using Word, yada, yada, yada. And second, were all the tutorials out there of how to use uh, WordPress. Uh, it's still true today. There's a lot of uh, help out there online that you can pretty much Google it, and someone will give you an answer as to how to do things from a pro programmatic uh, perspective. Uh, it's repository of stuff. Uh, with this, I mean the vast amount of plugins, themes, hacks, all that stuff is out there. It's, it's very, it's very, very vast. And that all, always, you know, brings some trouble from time to time. Uh, you know, vulnerabilities with the platform. Uh, people might have an opinion about the coding standards, about it being PHP, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I've come to the conclusion that there are four types of uh, people out there who are working as WordPress developers. The first one, it's plugins, people who build plugins, uh, be this for themselves, clients, or for the whole world. Same as with themes, theme development. Uh, Core, we had a guy who spoke here today. Uh, he was, uh, his name is um, Jonathan, I think, from Bluehost. Uh, yeah, he's a, core, he's a core contributor. He works directly uh, with the project. And here I would like to quote my boss. It's people who like to configure WordPress. And those people may or may not code, but they do know how to use the dashboard. They do know their snippets of, of, of scripts here and there, but they're just not comfortable enough to fully start, you know, smashing that door or, or, or going through that gate where they become a fully uh, fledged WordPress uh, developer. So this talk is about pretty much any of these four. Uh, I try to simplify things as much as possible. Um, part of the things that I like to do when it comes to WordCamps, I like to teach basics. I like to teach fundamentals about WordPress development because you never know what might stick to someone and what concepts will that person bring back home and apply it. And also, no matter how expertise you are, they might say, say oh, I didn't know that. It's, that's pretty cool. So what do I need to know in terms of technology? Um, one of the barriers I, I, when I tell people that I am a WordPress developer, they, they tell me, but I'm not good at math. I'm like, what do you mean you're not good at math? Yeah, I see the code, and I see those numbers, and I see this, and I see that. And that's like, dude, man, <laughs> I, just like you, I take out the calculator to add numbers up. I mean, it's not like I know formulas. What you're talking about is computational thinking. How do computers make 
uh, how do you uh, change your mindset so that you can instruct a piece of software to make decisions. And that is called compute, uh, computational thinking. It's an abstract way of thinking of solving problems that computers simply cannot do. And I always tell people an analogy of turning the lights off. For us humans, it's as simple as walking a straight line and hitting that switch and the lights are off. But if you instruct that to a computer, you have to give computers a step-by-step -step instruction in order to do so. Uh, like, for example, walk until you reach a wall. Once a wall, stretch your hand. S once you stretch your hand, is there a light switch? Yes or no? No? Keep searching. Yes. Pull the switch. Are the lights on or off? and so on and so forth. And that is exactly the mindset that you need to have in order to solve everyday problems. And I always notice that people go straight into a language. They go straight into learning any given language, computer language, and uh, they don't think about the computational aspect of it. They don't think about the problem solving because you go straight into the language and I sometimes feel and, uh, that it's, it's too much at once. And in university, I took a course that it was just paper and uh, pencil, and you had to solve problems like this, like the one I just gave you about the lights. But uh, it could be about um, calculating a, I don't know, an average of grades within 40 students. How would you instruct the computer to do that? And it introduced you to principles such as data. What type of data can a computer handle and what not? What is a integer? What is a number, a floating number? What is a string? What is an array? So I've always felt more in the camp of learning these uh, beginners, these basics, in order to fully transition yourself to a computer language. Because what uh, differenti differentiates a computer language from the other, it's it's pretty much the rules, the syntaxes. It's like speaking English versus Spanish. It's different syntaxes of way of saying things, of declaring things, and it's the same with computer languages. What, you know, some people might lean towards JavaScript, for example, which is a computer language. Others might lean towards PHP, Ruby, so forth and so forth. But the computational thinking aspect of it will never change. This is, this is the mindset that people tell you, oh, it's like solving math, I'm not good with math. But it's, it's, it's really not. It's the logical thinking that will allow you to solve problems. And I think that's one of the beautiful aspects of, of, of being a developer. It's having that mindset, that logical mindset, that abstract way of thinking of, of solving everyday problems that uh, you know, I, I really, really like. Because um, you know, there are a hundred ways to solve a thing. I mean. I could have asked you how would you turn the lights off and you would have told me a different answer or a different solution you know, compared to what I have. And, and sometimes I could say, man, your solution is good or your solution will fail if this and this will happen. And that's why this, this, this career is it's, it's, it's so beautiful because it's, it's comparing mindsets, it's comparing ways of solving problems that I, up to this date I still find fascinating. So, if you're looking for courses out there, try to find courses that involve that, that involve algorithm um, exercises so that you can exercise, you can do more and more of these problems because they will also tell you about certain things about computers, about programming, such as iterations, about loops, about functions and what they are. But when you're writing them on a piece of paper, it's far better to learn as opposed to going straight into a code and saying, oh man, I can't handle both the syntaxes and the, the, the uh, logical aspect of it. And I, and I think that's where most people get frustrated with it and they say, I'm just not good enough for it. And I, I, I would heavily disagree with that. It's just that you don't, you haven't, f you, you're doing too much at once, like both the mindset and the, the language. So having said that, uh, WordPress, does use quite a few languages under the hood. So it uses HTML, uh, CSS, PHP, JavaScript, and SQL. So all of them combined is how WordPress works. So when I make a request uh, to a website and the server um, processes that information and it says, oh, you're a WordPress website, uh, I'm going to use that URL to fetch 
a specific boat post from the database and I'm going to use the PHP logic all that logic in order to retrieve the content of that post because in the end WordPress uses the database to store post information uh, options um, categories tags all that information is stored within a database so in the life cycle of how WordPress works it boots and it starts sequentially doing things until it gets you all that information and it ships it back to you using uh, HTML, CSS, and PHP. So when people ask me, so what, what should I do? Should I start with PHP? Should I start with JavaScript? Uh, I'm an old guy, so I'll go with PHP for now. <laughs> uh, I, I've, I've, I've had some, uh, you know, over the past years, I've had to transition more and more into JavaScript because of the block editor and because of how WordPress, yes? Yeah, uh, just to comment on that, uh, JavaScript is really, it's low barrier to entry um, in that you can do your, you can do all your practice stuff just in a browser, you don't have to worry about all the server stuff. So That's true. From that perspective, I'd say start with JavaScript, but... Well, that's true. <laughs> but when I started with WordPress, it was uh, most it was mostly PHP, and it was mostly CSS, and it was HTML, and and JavaScript came later. So, and I had difficulties transitioning to JavaScript. I felt like I was writing I don't know like uh, it was it, it's rough. It was rough. <laughs> but I, I'm I'm still not there. But but I'm working on it. Um, so all of them combined is is how WordPress works. So how. How much do I need to know about this? Uh, how many, it's until you feel more and more comfortable with it. And I'm, I'm gonna have to quote uh, Steve Jobs on this. Uh, um, you, you're, gonna, you, you're gonna have to love this because if you don't love the code ad, coding aspect of it, uh, I, just, I, I just don't see it. And, and one of the things I love the most is not knowing, you know, not knowing. And um, one of my favorite philosophers of all time, it's, it's Socrates. And he once said, the only thing I know is that I know nothing, which is true. And I really don't know anything. And every day I have that mindset because that allows me to know more and more as the years go by. But I'm infinitely curious about how do things work. And uh, th I think that's part of the also mindset and, and, and that you're going to have to have in order to do that. Uh, I'm keep going back. Uh, what else? This is also about life. You're going to have to use blood, sweat, and tears. So you better get the yoga pose right. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of times, and I, I trust me, there's a lot of times when I don't have the answer to something. I, I just don't. And uh, you get frustrated, you get angry, you don't talk to your significant other, and she asks you what's wrong with you. Are uh, you breaking up with me? You've seen the memes. So <laughs> it, it, they're all true. Uh, you just, you're just thinking about the solution. You're just thinking about things you've tried, you've tried, you've tried. But in the end, um, and I will quote, and I'll give you another quote. It's called by Churchill, and it's, it's given by Churchill. And success is merely going from failure to failure without losing your enthusiasm. And you, you just got to keep on going and keep on thinking and, and there will come up a new way for you to solve it. It may work, it may not work. And trust me that when it works, you feel like, <laughs> I still have that feeling today. When it truly works, you feel fantastic because you, you felt like you've, I don't know, I'm not into climbing, but I guess it feels like, you know, climbing a mountain, being at the summit and say, hey man, I made it. So you feel very satisfied with yourself because all of the effort, all of the, all of that, thinking, researching, trying, discarding, and having that code up and down, and you don't even know how it, what it looks like, but in the end, it works. That's also one of the things that you got to have, and you got to be persistent about it and saying, no matter what happens, I'm not going to give up. And I, I think that's also one of the, the key things of, of, of becoming not just a uh, WordPress developer. I would say in anything in life, you got to persist. You, you can never give up. And... Uh, at the end of the clouds, there is the sun. So you gotta, you gotta have faith. Um, and specifically, what do I need to know about WordPress? So some say WordPress is a platform. Others say it's a framework. Don't ask me which one I think. But what they all say is that it's a content management system and it is an event-driven software application. And I'd like to highlight this last part, that it, it is an event-driven uh, application because that ties up with what uh, Jonathan says this morning about hooks. 
when you go to uh, the website, the WordPress websites, and it starts to boot, it starts to sequentially do things. And as it does, you can hook into those things, and you can alter the behavior or the data or, the, or its data to your liking as a developer. And that is why WordPress is so, so powerful, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a software application that, as it runs, you can tap into it, and you can do pretty much whatever you want without touching core. And that was, that's why I love uh, talks such as the one he gave, because that's like an aha moment that I had as a developer, because when I started, I mean, I'm not going to lie, I did like everybody. I just copied and pasted stuff in the functions file, and it worked, and I was like, yeah, man, this is the best, you know? This is, I love this, you know, I'm getting, oh, WordPress is fantastic, you know, this is awesome. But when I fully understood the whole aspect of it being a, uh, an event-driven software application where I can hook into these things and change the behavior, that's when, as the meme goes, that's when everything illuminated for me. I was like, oh, yes, it is. And from there on, I could fully have m even more control as to what I could do or could not do as a uh, developer. So plugins, um, as a developer, um, and I say this also to business owners, start, start using as little plugins as you can. And people usually ask me, well, how, man, how much is enough? I can't give you a ball, ballpark number, but when I go to a website and see a client, and when I see over 20, I start to worry a little bit about it because I'm like, okay, performance-wise, it could be a hit or it could be code that you don't really know what's in there. And if you want to start growing as a developer, start making your own little plugins. It doesn't matter if it's something that it has already been made. Uh, I'll give you for an example, like mm, metadata or creating your co own custom posts. You know, th yeah, there are plugins that can do that. But you could also make your own little boilerplate plugin where you as a developer can configure that stuff and start making your own. And that way you will have your own plugin with your own code, which it might be bad, it might be great, but it doesn't matter. It's yours and you will understand it. And as you get more and more clients, you will start to notice that you will modif you're going to start modifying that code to your own liking. So don't rely much on third-party plugins for some functionalities or try to not to rely much on that. I mean, I'm not going to tell you, yeah, why don't you do a backup plugin on your own? I mean, <laughs> you did. Oh. Okay. All right, to each his own. <laughs> but, I, but, you know, making simple things like, uh, you know, uh, create your own categories or creating your own uh, metadata or creating your own post types or having your own settings. You know, try not to rely on the plugins, on plugins built by others, but instead build your own. Even if the process takes you a lot, you will also, like I said, you will find yourself using that code over and over again for different types of clients and you will grow as a developer as you use it more and more because you will, you're never going to be satisfied with what you do. Uh, you're going to say, man, my code is horrible. I need to redo this. Or, man, I just saw a tutorial on Twitter that this guy is doing this, this, and that. I mean, I got, I got to do this on my own. And, uh, that, and that's how you, you get started. Same goes with themes. Um, I, don't, I don't know which talk it said. Uh, they asked, what theme do you use? And they were like, oh, I use this, but I've modified it to yada, 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 yada. And that is exactly it. You're going to start with a boilerplate theme. I don't know which one. I mean, there are pros and cons to each, but what you will find, what will happen is that you will find yourself modifying that theme to your liking. You're going to modify it like, I don't need this. My th this theme should do that. This theme, I don't know, this part, you know. Uh, and you, before you know it, you start modifying it more and more. Um, I started like that, and next thing I knew, I had a theme that did custom post types, that did metadata, that did... Uh, tags that did settings all to my liking all I had to do in the end was just configure a race just configure a, a couple of objects and say okay this is going to be for my uh, for my theme options these are going to be for my settings and everything I had it under control which brings me to the subject of the whole builder aspect uh, of the talk that I that I saw today Yes, with builders you can give clients the ability to they can do pretty much what they want. Th that is true. But when you develop, you can also control 
the thing to do exactly what you as a developer want. And you can limit the, the, the way the client interacts with him because he said it. You know, they only call me when it breaks. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I don't want to be called when it breaks because when you develop, you can disallow clients to even break it because clients will be clients. I mean, <laughs> they, no, it doesn't matter which part of the world we're in. Clients will always be clients and clients will break things. Clients will break things. So as a, when you start doing your own stuff, you can limit the way uh, it behaves and you can restrict clients from breaking your site or doing stuff that you as a developer definitely do not want to be called for. And uh, I think that's a win-win situation. Um, documentation is your friend. I do have to say, WordPress has fantastic documentation. It's one of the best that I've, that I've, I've dealt with and I've dealt with quite a few bad ones and but uh, these are the URLs I'm not gonna go over the documentation of course but um, I don't know uh, maybe Topher knows why are we getting rid of codex um, I, don't I don't know either I, I, love I love the codex as well and I've even had a friend say don't call it codex call it developer resources I'm like man I started with codex it will always be codex for me but the second one is like the new one, and the codex is like the first one. And I heard through the grapevine that they were, they were trying to migrate it from the first one to the second, but it hasn't really happened yet. So, you know, you can go. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, but I still go to the codex, and I still love it. And call me old, but I, it's codex for me. <laughs> so... Use it, it's, it's great documentation. It usually has examples and by the community so that you can you know, you can see it in action and see how it behaves. Um, I would say you need to learn about the loop. Uh, the loop is the way WordPress uh, fetches post uh, for the type of page it, or the kind of, for the type the URL it's currently in. So depending on what that address bar is, WordPress will infer what type of loop it needs to go over in order to fetch that post information. Uh, once you are in the loop, you can obtain information about a post. What kind of information? Content, title, date, the author, metadata, uh, tags. Um, yeah, yeah. So pretty much when you're in a loop, you can fetch all of that information and adjust it to your needs. So it's important that you know what the loop is because you can have multiple loops within a page or you can have just one loop, which is the way WordPress deals with it. Um, one of the things I, I learned and I loved it was a template uh, hierarchy. How does WordPress know which files to load within your theme? The answer is template hierarchy. Uh, in that URL, it, it will it explain what the hierarchy is, and it has this beautiful graphic, well, it's not beautiful, but it's really useful, of how WordPress determines, based on your theme architecture, which file to load and why. And that, that was also an aha moment for me, because when I, when I discovered it, I said, well, now I can, have different, I, I can have a different design layout for a category versus the blog post or I can have a different design for my taxonomies versus, uh, yeah, the block. Or even within the same categories, I could have a category called real estate, which would have a different design versus a category of, let's say, sports. So as a developer, you have greater control as to how to make those layouts within HTML or CSS, or even the data that you grab. So knowing about template hierarchy is really, really, uh, important. Um, the WP query class is also important. Uh, the WP query class um, allows you to do uh, custom loops. How do I make a custom loop? And what do you mean by a custom loop? Um, let's say, for example, I have a website that is about recipes. And you have the recipes and they're all listed in a chronological order. So recipe one, two, three, blah, 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 blah. And you're like, Italian cuisine has the best click rate. They tell you from marketing. You got to put Italian cuisine posts at the end of those uh, things. 
And you're like, how do I do that? And the answer is WP query class. That class would allow you to make a custom query based on the parameters that you as a developer uh, want to set. So going back into this uh, computational thinking is I am going to do, I'm going to fetch posts off a database that have the category of Italian within my recipes. So I'm only going to fetch posts that are Italian category. How many do I fetch? And published. And published, of course. Yeah, very important. <laughs> that's true. See, that, that's also part of the computational thinking. He just said published, I assumed. And I would have probably posted drafted had I not looked at that uh, point he made. So once, do I want them to be random? Is there, uh, excuse me, Mr. Marketer, is there a metric that you can, you have for me that I could say, oh, these are the posts that I need to publish, and he will say, yes, within each post, there is like a, I don't know, a counter. So that is metadata, that's information about a post, and it's a number, let's say it's a number. So high posts have this high number, whereas, you know, articles that don't interest people have a lower number, so you can grab that metadata and say, okay, give me the five most recent posts that are of Italian category, that are not, that are published, and have this metadata, you know, the highest metadata possible. So that way, after each recipe listing, you will have the top post, you will make the marketing guy happy, and you don't have to think about all this, oh, what plugin can, can do this, you know, what am I gonna do, yada, 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 because you can master the WP query class, and you can make your own queries and get that information. Needless to say, the, this class also supports uh, comments. I think it's uh, also authors, and I think metadata, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, so it's a, it's everything. I've, I've, it's so powerful that I've only used it for posts, to be honest with you. I've never used it for anything else. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's something that you, you, you gotta like more or less understand in order to make your own custom queries. Um, right, where am I? Oh. Custom post types and taxonomies. It's important that you know how to create your own. Like I said, it's a good starting point to make your own plugins. Um, you know, we always uh, bumped into clients that, uh, you know, it's not good. At, it's just uh, not um, good enough what WordPress has out of the box. I mean, WordPress is a content management system, and it has posts and pages, and that's about it. But let's say you're working with this, uh, I don't know, movie theater and you need to work with movies so how do you solve that well I can create a custom post type called movies and start displaying the information there and you can have its own taxonomies which is a fancy word for categories or tags and you can have its own tags tied specifically to this type of post so we can use uh, genre we can use actors we can use directors we can use uh, I don't know yeah that's about it so you start to solve problems by using solutions that WordPress has to offer. So these two are URLs that you can consult in order to create your own. And again, it's, it, I'm, I'm not gonna get ph philosophical about the coding standards as to whether you should create your own plugin for that or that you can use your theme files in order to do so. It's really up to you. I used theme files for a lot of years before I started another job where they forced me to use plugins and you know, I, I swiftly adapted to that. Metadata, uh, it's really important that you know, that you understand the concept of metadata. So metadata, it's basically data about something. Um, most of the cases, it's going to be data about posts. And going back to the movie example, we could add a, let, let's get fancy here, let's get creative. We could add a year the movie was published. Uh, we could add a rating, let's say it's a, a, a start, yeah? Languages. Languages, it supports. Release date. That's true. Well, languages, you could argue, no, no, it could be a category, a taxonomy. Well, but, but it could be also a metadata, you're right. So that information is information about a post, and you can have all sorts of type of data related to a post. So it's important that you understand how metadata works and you can create your own. 
yes, I know advanced custom fields exist. <laughs> yes, I know it's really easy, but if you start creating your own little pieces of data, even if it's a text string, it doesn't matter. You know, you start grow, you start to understand more and more as to how uh, WordPress works. Metadata is not just uh, related to posts. It can be added to authors. It can be added to comments and it could be added technically to uh, images because images are type of posts. If you ever get that interview, by the way, it's a, it's a type of post that comes out of the box. They asked me that question. They were like, name me five type of posts that come out of the box when WordPress is installed. And I'm like, bah, 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 bah. and yeah, so images is one of them. It's called attachments. Um, the settings API. The settings API is the options that you see when you either activate plugins or when you go to your dashboard and you see the settings. That little menu options that you see on the left, uh, they're called the settings API. So uh, you can have your own settings. That You can have it for your theme. You can have it for your plugin. You could have it for whatever it is that you want. But the important aspect is that you more or less understand how can you implement one, even if it's just a text field. How can you sanitize that data? How can you display it? Um, that sort of things. When I do client work, I usually put all the general information about a client as settings. Um, so because clients want to modify, let's say they, we have, I have a form and they have three fields and they want to customize the placeholder. So I use a settings. I use the settings API to use a panel specifically for the form, so that the client can modify that. Because, like I said, uh, comparing that to the builder, I do not want the client to go to the form, edit the form, and then mess up the form, and then say, "Oh, my form isn't working. You know what? What's going on?" And I say, "Yeah, bro, you you messed it up. You know." <laughs> I mean, yeah. But whereas if you go to the settings API, that's you had one job and that's it, you know, do that and modify it and be done and over uh, with it. Mm. Actions and filters. I'm not going to go into detail a lot uh, because Jonathan gave a great talk about that. But actions and filters are pretty much uh, ways that you can change either behavior or data when it comes to WordPress and its booting sequence. This is the URL. They're called hooks. Um, but uh, there's two types of hooks. There's two flavors called action and filters. Actions modify behavior. So let's say, for example, um, a type of action that I can do. Think of oh, oh, I could add a JavaScript file conditionally, saying I only want to add a JavaScript file if the category is real estate. So you use an action to hook into that, and if the condition is met, you put the JavaScript. Because when I started, yeah, I, I grabbed the theme header, put the JavaScript, and like, yeah, it's done. But as you, as you grow and you mature, you're like, why am I serving this file to people who do not need to see it? I'm bloating the theme more and more. Maybe I should load this file if the category, or if I'm in a blog post, or if I'm X, Y, Z, I should just load the, the, the file and not load it everywhere. And filters uh, are, for example, if I need to modify something like, let's say, the post. Uh, blocks, I mean, I can't avoid it. That, that's part of the reasons why I'm transitioning more and more into uh, JavaScript. Uh, you know, extending existing blocks or create your own. It's, 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 it's been a challenge, but uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm enjoying JavaScript more and more. Um, you know, uh, we some, some of us as developers get pretty we get pretty protective or jealous about the technology stack that we use and we're afraid of, of, of what you said change you know it's it's scary it's letting go of what you knew of all the things that you worked on for so many years and you got to start all all of a sudden doing something new it's 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 something it's it's hard to let go but it's also gratifying because you grow more and more even as you're letting go of all that that you loved and treasured for so many years and frustrated you. Blocks is, is one of those things. It has been one of those things for me. Um, I, I'm, I'm getting more and more into it. I waited a couple of years because when Matt said in, in Nashville, okay, 
we're doing blocks now it's coming it, that was like a huge bomb and i felt like you know we gotta wait for the debris the dust to settle before we can have a positive or negative opinion about it i have to say it's been really positive i absolutely love the way wordpress is taking it to the future i think it was in, initially i was scared of it but now i feel more confident confident about the change i think the block editing experience is a is a huge opportunity for both developers for people who are new to wordpress who people who want to do websites out of the box I, I and i say this from wordcamp to wordcamp i go to there's plenty of blankets for everybody so we're all going to fit in nobody's going to be left out and we just have to continue you know growing a few more tips, uh, just just to I can close. Um, the REST API, um, that's it's it's a little techy, but it's basically like hitting hitting a, an endpoint so that you can grab information. I'm not going to get into the techy details. The WP CLI, that was really important for me to know. Uh, that's basically like a command line that allows you to fully administer a WordPress website. It's useful when you don't have the credentials to go into a site or the, the client doesn't even know what his WordPress login is. You don't know the email. He doesn't know the password. You don't know anything. And he gives you a hosting access or something. And the hosting happens to have WordPress. So you can go in via the command line and start administering the website. You can change the password. You can reset users, create your own, or if you yes Disable all plugins. exactly exactly if you have a problem if your web you, your website is down and you're like holy crap what's going on you go in there you disable the plugins and you stabilize the condition so that you can triage as to what's going on so it's really really useful to have that tool and know about it uh, understand your DB. Now, I'm not going to. I'm not going to tell you it's like, hey, you got to be a database administrator, blah 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 blah. But understand tables. Uh, what WordPress uses out of the box. Um, how do they work? What information does it store? Um, so that you can understand more and more. Uh, you know the true inner workings uh, of it. A workflow. I haven't discussed workflows. There's plenty of talks about that. And in the end, I think workflows. Are, are like the way we dress. Everybody got their own way. Everybody know. Everybody got their own way. So I'm not going to say here, hey, my way is better, your way is worse. Everybody got their own way. Just make sure you have one. You know, make sure you don't go there bare naked, but uh, with you know, <laughs> with just Visual Studio Code, and that's about it. Well, you can have Sublime, but but that, that that's more or less my my way of saying. Some people love local. Others still use MAMP. Others use what? Well, there you go. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's your workflow. It's how you like to work. And if it works for you, that's great. And yeah, that is that. Responsibility. Uh, responsibility in the sense that if we're doing work for our clients uh, or others out there, make sure that you use correct standards, that you sanitize data, that you think about overhead, about bloating. Because if we get really philosophical about this, Code that is bloated means, uh, in the end, technically more pollution because it's more data that you need to download, which in turn, it's more information that you need to fetch off a server, which in turn is more power. And so if you can save a few hundreds of kilobytes here and there, think of it that you're doing the environment a favor as well. I mean, you're, you're shaving off data that is not necessary for the client or users to, 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 to show. So... As a developer, you have the power to do that. And community. I mean, I'm here. <laughs> she was here. And the sense of community that and Topher's here. And, and you all are here. Um, the sense of community that WordPress has, even after 13 or 14 years of using it, it's still as strong as, as my love for, for what I do. And uh, I, I think it's one of the amazing aspects of, of what WordPress truly really is, knowing people who, who are just, you know, we're people that do extraordinary things. And uh, I'm really, really happy to be part of that. So with that said, thank you very, very much. <laughs> Sorry if I moved too much. Did I? That's right. <laughs> Questions, if, there are, if there's time. Yeah? No? That's great. Uh, 
No, I do not. It, uh, it leverages gravity forms. Okay. But it just asks you all the questions you need to answer to write out the code for things like custom post types and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then gives you a chunk of code. Okay, that's cool. And then you put it in your own plugin. So it's sort of like a half step between actually writing it yourself. True. But you're making your own plugin, but you're less likely to miss a comma and then cry for a week because you can't figure it out. <laughs> that's true. You know what? I. <laughs> I had a, I, <laughs> raise your hand if it hasn't happened. Uh, I had a guy, he was literally crying because the code didn't work. And it turned out he put a zero instead of an, uh, an O. And uh, yeah, he, he, yeah, yeah. But, no? <laughs> so, but that's also important because that, you can use that and you can fine tune that to your liking. And let's say you're, not, has, you're like, man, this gravity form is great, but now I needed to do this, this, and that. And you extend the code, and uh, and, I, and I think that that that's important. And this last week, for the very first time ever, I used ChatGPT to write a plugin, <laughs> and it was very short, and it leverages the WP query you were talking about. I wanted the featured image of the most recent published post, mm -hmm. and no other data, just the featured image. Okay. And it was going to go at the top of an archive page, so that that image would change as the first post of the archive change. Correct. And it gave me perfect code. It was over-engineered and I ripped out a third of it, but it was perfect, it was fine. Um, but using WP Query, I was able to get just the image of the most recent post from the post post type. You know, you gotta yeah. get all the ducks in a row or you yeah. somewhere. Yeah, I have had that problem before and what I do is Within the loop, I ask if this is the first uh, instance of the query. Oh, yeah. If so, put the featured image. If not, continue with. But the problem I had is on the second pages. That's when I had to engineer a, li a little bit. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and it goes back to the analogy I said about turning the lights off. His solution is way different than mine. And uh, I probably would have used this. Yes. Yeah. You can do that within the WP config file. Yeah. 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 That could be a good idea for a plugin. Like, hey, let's. Well, how do you write your WP config, though? That's. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's part of my boilerplate code as well. Yeah. WP config, no editing within WordPress, please. Yeah, I don't know why WordPress has that on by default. It should be off, and you should turn it on if you want. But it's not a perfect platform. <laughs> yes. More questions? Yes. Uh, back to the point about taxonomies and metadata. You, you were kind of caught up with our discussion, right? Yeah, because she was saying about the languages. Right. So yeah, and I was like, that could be metadata. Yeah, so like, for example, like, let's say I had, um, I had a custom post type of t-shirt. Yeah. And I had small, medium, large, extra large, extra large. Would that be metadata or would that be a taxonomy? Would that be metadata or would that be a taxonomy? I think it could be both, but... If you were to ask me which one I would prefer, I would go with taxonomy because that would make querying it be fast, uh, better, easier for me as a developer. Because, yeah, because if I do it as metadata, I would have to query it as metadata. And I mean, I. I But, but taxonomy is a way of organizing posts and information and, and stuff like that. 
but the sizes is, is something you could organize as. Could you, could you put it like this? So maybe metadata could be anything, whereas the taxonomy is one of a limited set of things. So like metadata could be like nicknames. Like you have like an author. Like That's true. That's true. Like yeah. Puppies. That's right. Nicknames. Yeah. If you could have any nickname, that would be a metadata. Yeah. Because you wouldn't want a taxonomy for every single possible puppy. No, because you would get a lot of yeah. information. Yeah, that's true. So, as an old school developer, taxonomy queries are so much faster than meta queries that I would put everything I can in taxonomies to the point of abusing them to avoid that. I would have a discussion with this guy, but uh, so <laughs> but yeah. I would discuss with him, like, hey, Topher, you're going a little bit overboard here. Yeah, I actually did a talk entirely on custom both types. And I guess that would be and all that stuff. I'm going to have to go back through it But it goes to what you said. How can you label nicknames versus, la like, how can you organize data by nicknames? And if you think about it, you, can you organize T-shirts by size? Metadata is about the content. Whereas taxonomies and the fields that go along with it are about the content. Yeah. Yeah. And how you organize that in the rest of the screen. That's oh, okay. Yeah. If you had a taxonomy of nickname, it would be really simple to make a query that says, "Give me the most popular nicknames." That's true, because I would have to count the amount of times the nickname right. would appear. Okay, that's a point for you. I'll keep mulling it over. We'll yeah. discuss this at the after party. Don't yeah, worry. Okay. <laughs> this table here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, the debate on the on the right. stuff. Yeah, yeah, after party. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You're not going to grill me, are you? Maybe. Oh! <laughs> Uh, the difference is that, wait, taxonomy, wait, 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 what did you say? Why, why is it called taxonomy, not category? Because uh, category, I think it's a type of taxonomy. Yeah. And the difference is that, do you want the taxonomy to behave like a category or like a tag? There's a difference between each. Hierarchical and non-hierarchical. Yes, that's one of them. And the second one, and I have to give an example of Michael Jordan. He's a basketball player, right? right. He, he was. Yeah. But he's now a businessman. Right. So you can't really have a category about Michael Jordan because it's, it's, it's not a sports thing tied to, you know? It doesn't have the sports Michael Jordan thing related to it. Whereas you could have a Michael Jordan tag because it doesn't matter if the guy is a basketball player or a businessman or he goes into movie acting or, or Schwarzenegger for that, for that matter. He's a bodybuilder, he's an actor, and he's a governor, he's a politician. So you can't put Arnold Schwarzenegger as a category because category is, it has the parent-child relationship news, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Whereas the, the tag, yes. So taxonomy is like the techie or fancy name, but category and tag is how does it behave. So, yeah. So you semi-grilled me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, any more questions? Yes. I would say when I started, and maybe Topher can offer me some light, I did the website for my dad, for some friends, and from people I knew that even if I, you know, yeah. <laughs> they, they would not uh, hold it back against me. So I would, I would offer my services as a developer or, you know, custom theme design and start doing that. Yeah, that's how I started with custom theme development. And that is a good question. Yeah. Huh? Learn. Yeah, but no, where do you le where do you start? That 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 is the problem. Well, they've got learning or set yourself a task. I'm going to do a custom yeah. theme 
for my uh, friend's okay. website. Yeah. Yeah. But back then, back then, I don't know, I don't know if it's a lot, if it's alive yet. That, but back then, I took a a course by Chris Coyer, I think his name is, yes. about how to yes. do that, and that dude was amazing. <laughs> He's amazing. That course was amazing. Well, or yeah. So I started with Chris Coyer. All right, thank you.